Alex here with part 187 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero. If you haven't seen it yet, that's a video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to ending chronological order. We go now into the opposition to my ex parte motion filed by her attorney and i remember being extremely frustrated with this attorney because it's already i mean it's to the point where even he says he can't talk to her and yet because he's her attorney he has to employ the win at all cost mentality and file an opposition anyway um, if you want to learn more about why attorneys do this, please watch my video on the topic, win at all costs. It, it, it does, unfortunately, dupe the judge into making a mistake, which is disappointing because I have a feeling that he was probably hoping she wouldn't have ruled the way that she did. And ultimately, she fixes her own mistake, and I think it's less than a week after she screws up, but still, the damage has been done, and of course, it does give me the impression that I have today, which is that judges will blindly believe attorneys, even when their assertions are not supported by affidavit, which is, again in violation of the Supreme Court's precedent. The Supreme Court has stated a million times that arguments of counsel are not evidence, nor do they establish facts. And this is one of the reasons that I think the Supreme Court would have had a field day on an appeal to the judge's erroneous decision, because it's not based on anything. It's just based on arguments of counsel, which is nothing. There's no evidence there. Um, if you want to learn more about that, please watch my video. I think I talk about it in... I know I talk about it in some of the appeal videos, possibly in standard of review, maybe in filing an appeal, but I think it's more likely to be in standard of review. Um, anyway, this is something that the Supreme Court has stated, is when it comes down to evidence, arguments of counsel are not that. They're just arguments, that's all they are. And so you have to support your assertions when you're an attorney with some sort of evidence. The cheapest and quickest way usually is through their own, uh, through their own client, because their client's assertions factually, if backed by an affidavit, do you know, allow them to sort of make assertions like this in court and have them, you know, at least not necessarily believe, but at least um, found to be plausible or at least used maybe as a basis to have a hearing. But when you're when you're making assertions as an attorney and there are no there's no evidence to support what you're doing, then unless it's a pure question of law, an issue where there's no you know evidence that even needs to be considered, it's just purely legal, then you're not supposed to really get anywhere. Unfortunately, in family court, that's not really what happens. Too often, the arguments of the attorney are good enough for the family judge, and they don't even really care about the evidence or the assertions made by the actual parents themselves. We're gonna go into this now. Here we have my ex's opposition to ex parte motion for temporary suspension of visitation. We have the standard introductory paragraph indicating my ex is appearing through and by her attorney to oppose my ex parte motion. Here we have, let's see. This is just, I don't know why sometimes they put the signature on page two and on the end, but I guess this is what this attorney does. It's nothing, just a signature. Um, points and authorities factual background so he leads off with the hearing that was held on june 29th 2015 the fact that we agreed on many issues pursuant to our agreement my ex was to have visitation with our son during a portion of christmas break then he's stating that i indicated that i intend to file an ex parte motion to suspend her visitation this is true and then he is stating that i indicated that i intend to prevent my ex from having visitation with the child Okay. Oh, and he's characterizing my refusal to comply with the court-ordered visitation schedule. So, I guess attorneys see this as just doing their job where they grossly mischaracterize what's going on and leave out 90% of all of the facts to just reveal the 10% of the facts that make me look bad. 
But um, if you want to learn more about this, take a look at the two videos. One of them is Win at All Costs, and then the other one is They Will Never Say Good Things. So he's just characterizing this as me just refusing to, the, to comply with the court's order. He's completely left out the fact that she's in non-compliance for not turning over her um, residential address, an issue which has been thoroughly litigated, not just with this court, but with the Supreme Court to the point that it went to publication. But none of that matters. I am, of course, an evil person for violating the court's order and not letting her see our son. That's um, no surprise to me at all that that's what I'm reading. Discussion. Generally, movement must uh, give opposing party reasonable notice. This is true. These are the local rules that cover notice. He's also citing the rules that discuss ex parte. He's mentioning these key terms like immediate and irre irreparable injury. And um, he's also mentioning that we should get a hearing within 10 days based on this other subsection of the rule. If you want to learn more about irreparable harm, please watch my video on the topic injunctions. There's a specific meaning that the court gives to it. So I've asked my ex's visitation be suspended because she's not disclosing her address. More specifically, I'm claiming that our son is in danger because I'll be able, unable to help the child in the event there's an emergency. This uh, issue is one of the subjects of my omnibus motion. Okay, so the fact that he's telling the judge to look at this motion is actually a point in his favor as far as I'm concerned. So he could have left this out. He didn't need to tell the judge to look at this. The reason that I think he may be telling the judge to look at this is because he legitimately wants his ex parte opposition to be disregarded. He wants me to win. This motion is very damning to my ex's case, especially given the fact that his non -op that his opposition to that motion is just that he can't get a hold of her, so he can't oppose it. So this makes me think that maybe this attorney is doing a little bit more than just his job, and he's actually looking out for our child if he's trying to get the judge to look at this omnibus motion. Ultimately, this judge does look at this motion and rules in my favor on this ex parte motion, but she does so in a way that is extremely shady, and we'll go over that when we actually get to the orders that are entered on this issue. She will initially screw up and rule against me, and then later on, she'll actually read this omnibus motion, which is what this attorney told her to do. So she didn't even listen to him. She didn't listen to me. She didn't listen to the lawyer. She's just doing her own thing without paying any attention at this point, this judge. But eventually, she's forced to resolve this motion, even though she didn't look at it at the time that this attorney told her to. She looks at it later on. And when she eventually does look at this, she rules in my favor, not on just the relief that I'm requesting in that motion, but also on this ex parte motion, which is improper. She's not, she's not really allowed to do that. Um, we'll talk about all the improprieties when we get to... It's just a whole... It's a mess. It's an absolute mess. But we'll wait until we get to that point because we're not there yet. Um, however, let's see here. My ex told me that she will be staying at the Nugget in Sparks. Indeed, this is where my ex and her son Spain... Okay, so how is this relevant? So she's not a flight risk, but I'm not trying to put her on bail. Flight risk, this is stuff for, like, criminal cases. This isn't a criminal case. She's not being subjected to bail. She's supposed to turn over the address because I'm the other parent, and other parent is allowed to know where you live. So apparently he's trying to say it's okay. He's saying that what she's doing is okay, and that she's allowed to have a secret address because she told me what hotel she's going to be in. So now he's just gone back to the inane arguments of the past. The, I don't know how an attorney can say you're allowed to keep a secret address from your ex when the Supreme Court has already told them they need to knock that off. It's like they just don't care. So it's like this, the guy's almost got two personalities. He's got his first personality, which is to win at all costs and miss, because I know he's going to mischaracterize my arguments later on. And then he's got the second personality where he's like, hey, judge, take a look at this omnibus motion, which is not good. This is not a beneficial motion to his case. It's a very damaging motion. So on the one hand, he's doing what he usually does. And on the other hand, he's like, hey, you need to look at this because this is a big deal. And eventually he ends up being right that eventually when she looks at it, she does reach the right conclusion in the case. Um, anyway, let's move on. No emergency. My ex has told me where she will be staying during the vacation. I'm not entitled to know exactly where the child is at every moment during the visitation. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking to know where somebody resides is not asking to know where they are at all moments. So this is... An, this is He's mischaracterizing my argument like I predicted he would. So what the, these attorneys do this because it works. So the judge will see this and the judge will think that's what I'm actually asking for. She won't go and check to make sure. She'll think, hey, this opposing attorney says Alex is wanting this, which is a ludicrous thing. And so I'm going to rule against him. And I'm like, I never said that. Where did you get that from? Oh, well, 
your opponent's lawyer said you said that, and I just believe them. This is the this is the stuff that ticks me off. Anyway, if my ex and I will go to the movies or for a hike, she doesn't have to tell me where he will be. Again, I'm not asking for this. So he's just underlining this inane argument that I never made to make his argument look better. It, it works so often in family court that I can see why they constantly do this. A lot of people get so mad. They're like, this attorney is doing all these things that are unscrupulous. And it's like, guys, the judges let him get away with it. That's why they do it. If the judges didn't let them get away with this, they wouldn't do this. But that's not the way it works in family court. As there is no emergency, my ex parte motion should be denied. My complaints about her refusal to update her physical address should be addressed through the omnibus motion. Again, he's pointing her to the damning motion. So it's like he's, he's sending two messages to the court at the same time. So we'll, oh, there's going to be a lot to talk about when the, when the court actually resolves these motions. It's going to be a train wreck. I'm going to separate it apart to the best of my ability, and I'll explain it to you why what the judge is doing is shady. But we'll move on um, for now because we're not there yet. Conclusion. I have been informed as to where our child will be during my ex's visitation. There's no emergency. Ex parte relief should be denied. And then he wants me to pay for all these, these expenses. That that's just, This is exactly playing into my ex's hand. So what he's actually doing here is he's facilitating the conflict. He's instead of pouring water on the fire, he's pouring gasoline on it. He wants to fire, he wants to light it up. He wants to say not only um, are you wrong for asking to know where your ex lives, but he's saying you should also pay a whole bunch of money. Just, you know, how dare you ask? The reason why I get so upset, I mean, another reason why I get so upset is because of the gender bias here. If it was a if it was a guy that was refusing to tell the mother where he lived. I mean, everybody would be up in arms about that. It would be like, this guy must have some insidious like reason to keep secret. You know, why does he want to hide? But when it's the mom that wants to hide, there's this like subconscious feeling that maybe she's just abused. And so she needs to hide where she is and be a secret, you know, reside in secret locations to hide from this abusive person. So there's this gender bias. If you want to learn more about what I think about that, watch the video on the topic gender bias and why it's heavily connected to the other video on the topic discretion. Anyway, moving on. Affirmation, this is indicating that this document doesn't contain the social security number of any person. Certificate of service under Rule 5 indicating this document was mailed to both myself and my ex. We got the motion opposition notice, which is, let's see here, it's stating that I do not, or that he does not have to pay the $25 filing fee to file this. Index of exhibits, we have four exhibits. Um, all four of these exhibits we've already gone through, guys. And um, these are three emails which we would have gone through on my ex parte motion. So if you watch that video on the ex parte motion, you'll have gone through these emails. And this ex parte motion that I filed is the actual motion itself. So again, um, all these documents I've gone through. My policy with the My Docket series is to not go over stuff a second time. Instead, you can always just go down into the description below, click on the link, download the document for yourself, take a look, and if you think there's something in there that I missed, that I should look at, that I should talk about, please just mention that down in the comments below and I'll go ahead and do that, but that's it. Going into the aftermath, I didn't file anything, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. Max's attorney filed one document, but it was a free filing, so he incurred, or she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. Max's attorney would have had to put some time into this. Even if he couldn't communicate with her, he would have still had to prepare the document and prepare a response. Um, typically, I'm less inclined to give short amounts of time when it comes to a document like this that is not a form document, it's not a copy paste. So I think at the minimum, it took him an hour. At the rate of $250 an hour, that's gonna to come to $250 in attorney fees for my ex. As my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below and I will see you guys next time.